We look at wrapping up the fascia for the GN Depot, as well as cool switch stands that are unlike any other. Talk about rattle can custom painting and take a run with these C636s. And we cover all this on this episode of the GN in 1970. 70s. Well, there's something you don't see every day on the GN in 1970. It's because we're not on the GN in 1970. We're actually at a fellow Great Northern Modelers Railroad and taking a look at some extraordinary detail. I had to comment on these switch stands. All right, let's just take a quick look at what uh, what would be involved in creating one of these. Now, in this case, um, this isn't what Dwayne used. I believe he actually solders together his own LEDs. What? But this is by um, Evans Designs. You can go to modeltrainsoftware.com. This is a Pico. I ordered eight of these. I use these for signals, and you can see how tiny they are. And I'll show you a little bit uh, more detail here shortly. But the actual post, what I've got here is a .032 inch uh, outside diameter stainless steel tubing. It is hollow. It's tough to see there, but I'm actually using these for exhausts for uh, 187 scale cars. So we've got those. And then uh, I know you can buy cheap ones. Like This is a cheap pack of really tiny LEDs. Um, bought them online. Obviously not made in America. The insulation on these is actually too thick for this process that we're going to um, take a look at. The switch stand that I would consider using is this here. It's by Details West and it has the brass chevron which I'm looking for here for the Milwaukee Road. Um, but the Great Northern had a very similar style as well. So to look at exactly kind of what was going on uh, I did talk to Dwayne about how he assembled these. If you look at those two are two back-to-back -back LEDs and you wonder how small that is, if we put this next to um, you know a penny you're looking at about the size of the 9 or the 7 on this particular penny. So that's a tiny LED. I ran the wires down through the center. I'm not going to illuminate this at the moment but you can see the really fine wires and that's what's going to then go in through the center of the switch stand. So the switch stand would be like such and you'd run this through. You put your chevron on here and he actually created using a piece of filament. Uh, I'm just going to show you here this is a piece of a locomotive but he chucked it into a drill, a, a larger piece than this of course, but he chucked it into a drill. He drilled out the center portion by simply just holding the, this here and he drilled out the center portion which then allowed him to be able to slide it right over the light and then he had ended up putting lenses all the way around. He had green and red lenses. But when you're talking about some super fine detailing at a really small scale, this is at its finest. Um, no pun intended. Oh boy, that was bad. Great work by uh, Dwayne. Really impressed. It's probably the nicest switch stands that I've ever seen. And yes, his actually do turn. I didn't have any footage of him actually rotating, but they do rotate uh, when the switch is thrown. So that's a gist of what went into actually creating the switch uh, stand with the lantern on top. And a huge thanks to Dwayne for sharing the information for creating these particular switch stands with the lanterns. His modeling is exceptional. He's an extremely nice and modest guy. But to be able to have this opportunity to take a look at this stuff firsthand and see it in person, it was an honor. I had to share with you how these things were made. All right, here we are in YZ, and we're taking a look at where lime and lumber used to be. We've moved Hull Potato into this location where that white Sioux Lime potato box car is, and we've actually swung lime and lumber across the way. It's just going to be a little bit better, I think, for the operations. Um, for space, we want to be able to put like a 60 and a 40 foot box car, uh, and that just allows for it in that location. Now, when we swing around here, we actually need to put the fascia on the front of the railroad. The depot's in place. We're kind of mocking up where vehicles will go. Um, but we need to address what is going to go on the front. So obviously, it doesn't get left bare like this. All right, here we are looking at rattle can paints. When the question is asked, what do you use to paint your models? You're looking at it. I've had a lot of people ask about airbrushing and why you don't use airbrushing. Well, number one reason is I don't have a spray booth that's set up just to be able to pop in and be able to paint stuff up, as well as the cleanup method. Cleanup method with this, spray the model, done. Not saying that's the only reason why you might uh, use rattle can paints. I know people said they've been using them and had great success. Well, I have too, but there's people that are using this stuff. It goes on thick. It's not good. You got it at your hardware store for five bucks, and there's a reason why. It's meant for just this, furniture, stuff like that. Now, 
I end up using these because they're so fine. This is Tamiya. These are primers. Always put a primer down before you're actually going to paint your model. Why is that? It adheres to the plastic and allows them the paint to adhere to the plastic. You run into a lot of issues if you don't follow the steps properly. Clean your models, number one. Make sure you clean them with a, a degreaser. Maybe it's a, a Dawn dish soap or something of that nature. Make sure they get dried very well. <laughs> Don't use a cloth because you end up leaving behind debris and lint, but then get them primed. You get them primed, you lay down a nice layer. What's the reason for a gray or a white? It's actually just the brightness of the paint. As an example with this here, this is Santa Fe Red. You end up laying it over the white, you get a nice bright red. Lay it over the gray, it's a little bit duller, a little darker, but you get a little different color shift. So know what color you're laying down underneath. There is actually a darker shade. In some cases, they do even have like a black primer. But in this particular case, these are the ones I use. Looking forward onto the next things, as I mentioned here, this is Santa Fe Red. This is what I paint Great Northern Cabooses with. People go, what? Santa Fe Red? Well, that's what we've been told, that it's been a good match to the actual Great Northern color. We've used it. I've used it on a number of cabooses. Is it the right answer? Not necessarily. Everybody has their opinions and what they use when they mix their own paints. This is what we use, and we've had great success. When you remember the depot I ended up doing, this is Tamaya Luftwaffe Green. It ends up being a close green to the medium green that the Great Northern used on their trim. As you can see, aircraft paint works with railroad stuff as well. And then lastly is actually the clear coat. What do you use for clear coats? This is one that I use for a dull coat. It works really well. Um, thin layers. One thing to note, note is actually the spray. It actually comes out of the nozzle. This is a traditional nozzle. If you look at the ones that come with Tamiya, it's a lot finer coming out of here than here. So I go very fine. I always do thin coats as it is, but that's one thing to make sure you don't just coat it on. You notice the actual spray nozzle on this one? This is the finest of all three. From a fine factor, it goes here to here to here. Now, what I end up wanting to do when I end up laying down the dull coat is just a very light mist over the top of the car. Do it three or four times, and you get a really nice, soft, flat finish. The chalk bites into it if you're using chalk. It does knock down the brightness of your weathering if you actually just spray it over the top of all your weathering. But when it really comes down to it, it gives your car a lot better look. So that's rattle can painting in a nutshell. No, this is me in a nutshell. Help! I'm in a nutshell! How did I get into this nutshell? Look at the size of this bloody great big nutshell. What sort of shell has a nut like this? I mean, this is crazy. All right, here we are back at the YZ Depot. Things are coming together. Got the fascia on. There's a few more adjustments to make just before it gets painted. We do want to put a piece of plexiglass around the perimeter there just to be able to protect the depot itself. But all in all, I think we're happy with the fit. We got to adjust the actual parking lot itself a little bit as well as a few of the details around the building. But I think we're set and ready for operations. Who knows this funky car? Which merger road was the original owner of this car? Was it ASPNS? B, the NP? C, Frisco? or D, the CB&Q. If you guess D, the CB&Q, you are correct. These cars were built in 1967. All right, so we don't come out to the GN in 1970 enough to do a little rail fanning, and today we're gonna do just that. But why not do a little rail fanning the same way you'd watch baseball with a little play-by-play? -play? Then moving from left to right are these C636s and an unbelievable view of Union Yard. We've got an SD9 sitting in the background along with a pair of GP9s. Boy, are these things beauties. We've got a new SPNS there in the foreground. We just got that recently, as well as did a little extra detailing on these particular units. wonder why the strobe flashers aren't on. You know, that's a good question, Hank. It's really one of those things that you really have to leave up to the engineer. If they're going to turn them on, turn them all on. Are they rail fan or are they not? It's some interesting stuff today. Boy, and talk about interesting there is that uh, Woodside Caboose of the Great Northern. It's in Lindale Yard. As we got the 636s coming through the corner, they're going by Uniroyal and t and Wholesale. Boy, you really got to wonder, is t and Wholesale, is that actually really a place? Is that a location? Uh, I believe Uniroyal was uh, around the area. I know they're in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, but... TNB seems kind of interesting. Well, I know the backstory on that one there, Bob. Uh, TNB Wholesale is actually Teresa and Bill Wholesale. I'm not sure about Uniroyal being in uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Uh, that's not confirmed, but as we look at the rest of the scene here, we end up with uh, some pretty cool stuff. The 636s themselves are made by Bowser. They're a nice running locomotive. The uh, BN units, I believe, actually had their trucks exchanged. Boy, what do you mean by trucks exchanged? I believe that they had an issue. They actually rode a little too high, and you could contact the dealer, and they would send you a new truck. Yeah, that's actually 
actually correct there, Hank. That's a good thing to point out. Boy, are you Hank or am I Hank? I can't quite figure this out. I thought you were Bob. Well, I don't think it really matters who's who as long as we can check out this thing coming through the curve. We'll tell you whose curves I'd like to check out. All right, this is actually a family show. Let's keep it down over there, can we, Hank? Uh, my name is Bob. But anyways, let's take a look at how this thing is coming around the corner as we're approaching YZ. Boy, how far east did the uh, 636s make it? Boy, that's a good question. You wouldn't believe they actually made it to Chicago, but ended up working their way back to the west coast because those are the only people that knew how to work on them. Boy, that sounds plausible. Oh, it's plausible, all right, as is the end of this particular episode, because who wants to listen to two lame guys narrate a video like this? Not me. You gonna sign off? Yeah, we'll just leave it with you. If your tank is empty, you're probably out of gas. 70s. We really enjoyed creating these episodes of the GN in 1970 as well as Soothe the Milwaukee Road. The only way we know if you guys like these is hit that like button. You can hit it, click it, smash it, whatever it is that you're into. You can hit the subscribe button if you want to see on future episodes. Just make sure you ring that bell. And if you want to see more of the Great Northern, you can take a tour of the GN in 1970, which covers the HO scale Wilmer subdivision. You can also check out other episodes that I've done of Soothe the Milwaukee Road that covers the 1985 merger of the Sioux Line and Milwaukee Road in HO scale. Thanks a lot for watching.